on a scale of Borat to Roseanne Barr, how fat do I look right now? Borat. <laughs> <laughs> so this is officially the second episode now of Ukaipa 360, uh, our new podcast. So we All did right. the dry run with you. And then, uh, then we, we uh, worked out some kinks, and we recorded a, a first episode um, uh, with uh, Trevor Benson on, on public safety, a timely um, issue with our uh, homeless strategic plan coming up on its first year and all the success we've had there. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that episode, um, it's, uh, it's really good. This is going to be a great way to connect uh, with the community. I think all too often government is this kind of faceless machine, um, and... More and more people have a, a lack of trust in local government. Um, and uh, I think um, this long format podcast, which has become so popular, um, you know, the most popular podcast in the world right now is um, the Joe Rogan Experience, right? And, and some of those episodes are two hours, three hours long. So we're going to be here a while. All right. No, we're not going to go that long. But as long as I have enough water. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I think one of the reasons why um, they're so successful is that in this age of you know the 24-hour news cycle and and these prepackaged messages and short attention spans where people are watching you know 30-second videos and everything just seems so packaged up for you, right? Um, uh, I think people are hungry for something that's genuine and real, right? And um, this format allows for people to listen in on a discussion, right? It's just, it's real people talking, no scripts. Um, and, you know, it gives people an opportunity to get a sense of someone's personality. And I think, I think that lends itself to a, a building of trust, which is so badly needed in, in, in government right now at all levels. Yeah. You know, and, and we see it a lot here in local government, um, kind of the, the loss of civility in uh, public discourse. And um, um, we, we, we do a lot here in local government that impacts people's daily lives. A lot of people have no, no clue. So I think this would be a great way to inform people about what really goes on here at their local government and uh, the people who are um, serving them uh, and, and our community. Um, and here we go. Yeah, Epi that's great. Ep episode number two. Um, so... <clears throat> You do a lot for the city. You wear, you wear a lot of different hats. Um, you're a director of development services. Um, you're a city engineer, um, public works director. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about things like roads today. All right. All right. Um, you've been here a long time. Uh, you probably remember when there uh, weren't very many roads in Yukaipa. Uh, I do. I've lived in Yukaipa for over 45, actually 47 years. Mm -hmm. And I've been working for the city for... Uh, uh, a little over 20 years now. Wow. And yeah, the, I remember when there was only three traffic signals in the entire city. Now we're over, up to over 30, <laughs> well, 34 actually. So yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, not as many roads uh, back then as there are now. Yeah, definitely. No, I bet. So what, so what, you, you weren't born here though? Uh, no, I wasn't. I was actually born in, in Mexico. I moved to the United States when I was five years old. I moved to Yucaipa when I was five years old. Okay. Yeah, you know, and, uh, uh, many many years ago, actually, uh, I moved to Yukaipa and to the U.S. the day that Elvis Presley died in 1977. Wow. So, when people ask me how long you've been uh, living in Yukaipa in the U.S., uh, yeah, Elvis Presley. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. So, oh, wow. Well, yeah, I've seen the city. So, grow. so, so you went to probably Yukaipa Elementary. I went to Yukaipa Elementary, uh, Yukaipa Elementary School, and. Um, the junior high here in Yukaipa at the time it was Yukaipa Intermediate School and then Yukaipa High School. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So growing up, uh, it was always your dream, one day to to build roads. Uh, it was my. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was. What, yeah. what What made you want to be an engineer? Um, I've always liked the math and the science part, but um, you know, I do remember one day a funny story when I was a kid. Somebody had asked me, hey, kind of put me on the spot. What do you want to be when you grow up? And a few days before that, I had heard about engineers and what they do. And so that's the first thing that popped in my mind. And I said, I want to be an engineer. And I guess because I said it out loud, I said, that's, I told myself that's what I have to be. And yeah. that's commitment. And it worked out. From an early age. 
Yeah. <laughs> so where, where did you go? Uh, where did you go to college to become an engineer? I went to uh, University of Redlands uh, mm-hmm. when they had an engineering program, and uh, I, I received my degree in engineering. And then I actually worked in the mechanical engineering field for several years before uh, I uh, switched to civil engineering. Uh, I took some courses at uh, Cal Poly Pomona, and I'm a licensed civil engineer in the state of California. So okay, yeah. so, so Cal Poly Pomona is where uh, you got your engineering uh, degree, or was that at Redlands? Uh, it, my engineering degree was in Redlands. Okay, and when I switched to civil engineering uh, in order to take the 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 test to get my civil engineering license, I took some courses at Cal Poly Pomona. Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, University of Redlands at that time was their engineering program any good? Um, I, I it was great. It was, was the it? best one around. Really. <laughs> Uh, is that where you learned how to, how to do this? This is a utility pole right in the middle of the street. Actually, no, that's where I learned how to not do that. Oh. <laughs> and yet, this. So this is a fifth and county line. Uh, I got to say, I think this shows real uh, outside of the box thinking. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. out of the box thinking and it's, it's uh, in the middle of the road thinking, actually. Yeah, no, in, in the middle of the road thinking. <laughs> Um, so, you know, naturally, this, uh, uh, this was all over social media. Um, uh, it was posted on Ukaipa Bolton, you know, Facebook page. It had uh, 665 reactions, 264 wow. comments. And uh, th- th- these are some of my favorites. Okay, so um, Sean Murray said, you had one job. <laughs> I think he was talking to you. <laughs> Kim Figueroa said, well, now that ought to slow people down. It's a positive thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of name this is, but RC Alabama, this must, I don't even know if this is a real account, said, and the winner for It's Not My Damn Job goes to. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Joseph Larson says, It's the motorcycle slash smart car lane. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, probably my favorite, Eddie Moe's challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what? In all seriousness, I mean, th- th- this was pretty embarrassing for the city. Uh, how did we get here? How did this happen? Well, first of all, I appreciate the sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> how did we get here? That well, the uh, that location, as you mentioned, is County Line Road and Fifth Street. That is uh, one intersection of a larger project that uh, the city is working on in um, in partnership with the city of Cal Mesa. Um, it is. Uh, you know, as many of our infrastructure projects here in Yucaipa are, that project is primarily funded with grant funding. Mm-hmm. Um, and the answer to what happened there is, well, in order to, for the city to receive the grant funding, we had deadlines. And uh, one of those deadlines was that the, the construction contract had to be started by a certain, um, it had to be started by a certain date. And uh, we work with the uh, with uh, there was a collaboration with many other agencies with uh, between City of Cal Mesa, City of Kaipa, the utility agencies, and uh, in that collaboration, uh, you know, we try to work through a lot of hoops. And uh, Edison had a relocation plan to re- relocate those poles, put a lot of them, un- a lot of that infrastructure underground. Unfortunately, their timing didn't line up with uh, the grant funding deadline, so we had to move forward. The city of Cal Mesa and the city of Kappa had to move forward, had to move forward, and complete the construction work, or at least start the construction work, way ahead of Edison, and um, otherwise we would lose the grant funding. So it's, uh, it, you know, this is, it was a large project, and when you're trying to collaborate with a lot of agencies, a lot of utility agencies, Edison, Frontier Spectrum, it, it and try to meet deadlines. That unfortunately, that's one of the, one yeah. of the results. No, I got to say that 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 County Line Road project has been so incredibly frustrating. Um, because there are so many different um, entities involved, um, you know, and it's a partnership between two cities too. It's not just the city of Ukiah; it's the city of Cal Mesa, and um, you, know, it, we, you know, we're waiting on Edison and and you know other, uh, various contractors and trying to get everything was coordinated and lined up, but uh, sometimes things just don't go just don't go to plan, right? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it- so, yeah. So, so what, what what is the current status? Is this uh, is this uh, cleaned up? Now, I assume that pole that pole is not there today, so it must have been uh, worked out. Yeah, so that pole is not there uh, today. That that new roundabout at Catalina and Fifth has opened up for traffic, um, and uh, it hasn't. The project isn't completely done, and by that, uh, if you're driving along Catalina Road, you'll notice that 
Uh, we haven't completed the paving mm -hmm. uh, of the road. The reason for that is because uh, there's another utility agency, uh, the, the water company, um, South Mesa Water, who is going to be installing a brand new water line on County Line Road, essentially from the freeway uh, east to Douglas, which is uh, uh, over two miles, uh, actually approximately two miles. And so right now they have started that work. They started down by the freeway. Um, in the last uh, couple days, uh, that roundabout at County Line and Fifth has been closed during the day because they're installing the water line through that roundabout. And that, that in itself is going to be a lengthy project. They're telling us that it will be completed uh, early 2025. So once that is completed, then we will repave County Line Road. And in the, ne in the meantime, um, the contractor is scheduled to move in in September and complete the roundabout at Third Street and County Line Road. So if you're driving through there today, there's a roundabout at, at uh, California, Second Street, and at Fifth, and one remaining one at Third Street, so. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, I'm glad that that poll issue uh, was, was resolved and Me that, too. that uh, embarrassment is finally over. Or, uh, or is it? Let's take a look at what's going on here. What, what, <laughs> what, 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 what happened there? <laughs> that is a very large uh, speed bump. It's the world largest speed bump ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, what, did, did you learn this at, at, at Redlands or Cal Poly? I learned this at uh, UCAP Elementary School. Actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Well, that makes sense then. Yeah. Uh, what happened here? Uh, that's, uh, we, we have received a lot of questions uh, um, about this. Um, and also the city of Cal Mesa has also received a lot of questions about this. This, uh, you know, the, this is at Bryant Street and County Line Road. Um, how, a lot of the work that was done at this intersection, at this roundabout, you can't see because it's all underground. The whole storm drain system to get the storm water from one side of the intersection to the other is all underground. Well, um, uh, so while that storm drain was being completed, there, uh, the water, uh, we, we got some storm events, so the water was coming down County Line Road and then turning uh, left or south on Bryant Street. And, and we hadn't completed some of the curb and gutter along Bryant Street, so there is a potential that some of that water may go into private properties. So one of the ideas that we had is since it was, it's a temporary traffic control plan, uh, the contractor installed a speed hump to keep the water on County Line Road to prevent it from turning south and potentially flooding those properties. So it's. It's a temporary measure for drainage, and it also serves as a traffic calming device because the project isn't completed. But once the project is completed and we repave the road, that world largest speed hump will be no lo will no longer be there. It may be a traffic calming device, but it's certainly not a social media calming device. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this has also I, been a popular uh, a popular one on on social media. But uh, you know, there really are reasons why uh, the, these things happen, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, when this project is, is complete, it's going to be very nice. But it is a massive project down County Light Road with a lot of moving parts. So uh, I, I, know, yes. I know you and your team are, are, uh, are, are working hard on it. And um, I think eventually the residents will, will appreciate it. But I, I know it has been um, an inconvenience for, for a lot of people. So we're, we're looking forward to, to that, being, that being done. I'm wondering, though, um, if the problem with, with, with this project is really – that you're spending way too much time on the golf course. <laughs> yeah, apparently it is. See, there, well, there, there you are, on uh, the on the golf course. Yeah, with Ryan Miller, our economic yeah. development analyst. He's a bad influence, I think. He probably uh, yes, he you is. out there on the golf course. Yeah, there but you know. if you ever see me play on the golf course, you would know that no, I don't spend enough time on the golf course. <laughs> I should be spending more if I want to get better. <laughs> you must be one of those part-time employees I've been reading about on social media. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If by part time I mean what what fifty sixty hours a week, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's part time. Now, you wear you wear a lot of hats here. Um, uh, director of Development Services, City Engineer, Public Works Director, and you are involved in a, a lot of the projects um, that are going on uh, in town. Um, and one of those over the years um, has been uh, roundabouts, and uh, roundabouts I think creative solution to to a problem, but have certainly been um, controversial. A um, lot of social media chatter um, about about roundabouts, especially in light of uh, the city's uh, financial challenges right now. We're we're working our way out of a, a structural deficit. Um, but I did, what, this is a this is a good uh, uh, post on social media um, from uh, from Martin. 
It says, um, I received a mail regarding the financial issues for the city and sort of asking for thoughts. My main one is to take all the money that may be set aside for roundabouts and use it in other areas that are more important and stop putting roundabouts in. What a novel idea. Don't waste money on useless roundabouts. Mm-hmm. Did uh, the city waste money on roundabouts? Well, I, I, I don't believe, no. To, uh, mm-hmm. I don't believe the city wa- waste or used, what was the term again? Wasted. Was wasted wasted money. useless money yes. on roundabouts. No, no. <laughs> no, it, you know, that's, uh, um, that's one of the, the questions that I do receive a lot. You know, there's, uh, there's so many, um, roundabouts are a generally new thing, uh, right? You know, there's all these studies that have been done that, to say that they move traffic more efficiently, they reduce major the number of major traffic collisions and stuff. So, so, so that's why our city council decided to go down that road. But uh, one of the things that's important is that when, if the, since the roundabouts do uh, make it more efficient for travel for traffic to circulate, um, the the roundabout projects are a capacity enhancing project, which means that you're enhancing the capacity of the roadway. And the, the uh, funding that the city has used over the years for the roundabouts is funding that we receive uh, through uh, or, uh, Measure I funding, which is a, the half cent sales tax that was uh, uh, approved by the voters in San Bernardino County back in, in 2004, I believe. Uh, uh, 80, in the 80s. In the 80s. Initially. Yeah. Initially, yes. Oh. Yeah, so, so the city receives a certain amount of funding each year of that Measure I funding for capacity enhancing enhancement projects. So, so the money that is used for roundabouts is that is that measure I funding that can solely, it can only be used for capacity enhancing projects. We can't use it for anything else. And uh, uh, the other funding source is our development impact fee revenue, which is also uh, um, intended to be used for uh, enhancing the capacity of our arterial street. So, so no, it, uh, we the money that was spent to construct the roundabouts was money that was intended to increase traffic e- efficiency and the traffic circulation. Yeah. Um, so, um, but you know, so you're talking about the Measure I money. So Measure I is a half cent sales tax charged countywide, mm-hmm. and we get a portion of that back. And there's 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 two pots that come with that, right? There's the arterial, and then the uh, the local road the section, right? Yes. And so the roundabouts is it was the arterial, uh, correct? Uh, and so and, and that comes with a, a match. And so it's is right. it, I believe a twenty percent match that we have to. So eighty yeah. percent comes from San Bernardino County Transportation um, Authority Measure I funds, right? Right. Uh, and then we have to come up with a twenty percent match, which we, you know often we typically we use development impact fee money's there. Right. right. And, and uh, yeah, there, there's two different pots of money. The measure our arterial money is, uh, is that, that 80%, the other 20%, it has to be revenue from development, which is right. that development impact fee. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the things a lot of people don't realize about roundabouts, and I'm going to say some positive things about roundabouts, and then I'm going to explain uh, that we, we've shelved all future roundabouts. <laughs> so, um, Nukaipa has, you know, growing population. We've grown to city of 55,000 people, and, you know, there's uh, more demand on our roads, uh, certain segments of certain roads uh, experiencing congestion, um, and we're getting failing grades in terms of uh, traffic flow, right? And so, um, how do we improve that? Well, the, the traditional way is to widen the road. Right? Mm-hmm. And so um, when you look at areas of town like Uptown, where we have businesses on both sides and parking for those businesses on both sides, um, if we went the traditional route, then we would have to first acquire that extra property um, to widen the road, which in many cases requires eminent domain. Right? We're taking property away from private property owners, um, often, mm-hmm. often by force, uh, to, to widen that road and, and at great expense uh, to the city as well, because um, you know, purchase we have to pay market value when you take take property, and then you know there's the legal process that's expensive as well. So, the city at the time said, "Well, um, these roundabouts are a um, a different way to go. Uh, roundabouts improve traffic flow to the point that uh, um, the the traffic flows at an acceptable rate, um, and now we don't have to eminent domain private property." and take away from businesses and residents um, to um, uh, at least as much to mm-hmm. uh, to get the improvements to traffic flow uh, and, and to alleviate uh, traffic congestion, right? And yeah. so my understanding is uh, those are the reasons why uh, the city decided to, to go in, in that direction. Yeah, and, and in not having to purchase that additional right-of-way and the 
those, you essentially save money because you're saving money on construction costs and right away costs. Right, right. Yeah. And also, um, they're safer, right? I think a lot of people, a lot of the comments I've seen um, uh, are to the effect that roundabouts are so dangerous. You know, people aren't used to them. They're going to fly right through them. Um, uh, and um, while I think, you know, it may be true that there are uh, a slightly greater number of accidents with, with roundabouts, they, they are far less severe, and um, in terms of serious, life-threatening, and, and fatality accidents, much, much lower um, with roundabouts than traditional um, intersections. Yeah, there was a lot, of, a lot of information that the city council considered back in 2012 and then in 2016 when, uh, when the decision was made to, uh, you know, on these arterial streets, that were meant to be widened to four lanes and install traffic signals. You know, this, the decision was made to go to roundabouts instead for all those reasons, because they're safer. They would, um, the roundabouts would result in not having to widen streets, as, as you mentioned. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, presentations and a lot of information that we presented to the city council when they made that decision, uh, ultimately in 2016, to, to include roundabouts in our update to the general plan in 2016. Yeah. We have an interesting video, and it shows um, it shows two intersections, um, one with a roundabout and on the same road. So traffic's coming down, one on a roundabout, traffic flows through, comes to the second intersection, which is a traditional intersection, and the traffic all backs up. So let's let's take a look at that. So on the right here, we have the this is the same road. On the right here is the uh, the roundabout, no traffic backing up at all, and it comes down the street and um, up here in the top left. And now all of a sudden traffic is, uh, is backing up. To me, that's a great visualization. Yeah, you, you can, you know, one of the things in traffic engineering, how you measure the efficiency of a roundabout is how many seconds you have to wait at an intersection. And you can see on the top left at Third Street, the line of cars that, were, you know, you have to wait several, you know, seconds uh, a certain amount of time to get through the intersection mm -hmm. yep. so now that yeah. we've talked about how great roundabouts are um i will say that we have uh, shelved uh, uh future roundabouts that that, that were uh in the pipeline at, at least for now um, and i think it's right that we do that i mean as, as we mentioned that you know, the city's uh in a, in a in a deficit um and that's not just um you know uh, when it comes to to, to road maintenance and, and road mm -hmm. projects it's not just a question of, of dollars, but also of staff resources, mm -hmm. right? We, we can only focus on so many things um, at a time. And so uh, we're, we're really focusing on kind of the core functions of, of local government right now. Yucaipa's roads are um, a, a challenge to maintain, right? Because we have uh, uh, 209 miles of public mm -hmm. roads for a city of 55,000 people. That's a lot. Um, we're spread out over 28 square miles. Yeah. I think because we're more rural than a lot of other communities, we're more spread out. So we have more miles of road per capita than, than most cities. So there are fewer people paying in into that system. Um, but maintaining 209 miles of public roads is very expensive. And so we have to really prioritize um, um, you know, where we focus um, uh, the dollars that we have to spend on roads um, and the, the staff time um, uh, that can be de devoted to that. And so... Uh, we're, we're focusing on maintaining our existing network of, of, of roads. Um, I am very happy that uh, this fiscal year, we were, you know, the council adopted uh, a record high uh, budget of uh, $4.1 million um, for, for road maintenance, uh, for road repaving. Um, and uh, that's, that, that's pretty exciting. So I think we're getting, we're getting more aggressive. We, we've heard that residents are concerned about the conditions of, of, of roads and, and we're we're, we're tackling that. Yeah, we've heard a lot from the residents. And, uh, you know, it's every five years, we go through a cycle where we retest all of our roads, we test the asphalt condition. And that's the information that we use to prioritize which roads are going to be maintained or repaved. Next, uh, in 2023 was, uh, was the end of the previous five year cycle and beginning of the new, the new five year cycle. So we put together a plan over the next five years. Um, which includes, as you mentioned, you know, year one is going to be, uh, 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 it's going to include a budget of about 4.1 million. Uh, and that compared to the, um, for the previous five year cycle, where we averaged about 2.2 to 2.3 million per year, it's almost double the budget. So we're focusing on the road maintenance, 
um, in, not just as part of our larger uh, road maintenance component, but but you know we've made some some changes to our public works uh, process and our you know and by that I mean you know we have some additional resources, some additional equipment where we can address potholes uh, yeah. you know right away. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the city of Yucaipa app has been very useful in that you know people have been able to report issues out in the public roadway, whether potholes or anything else, and. Yeah. And uh, it's been, it's been. Uh, uh, I feel like we've, we've, uh, we have definitely improved our response time and uh, to our response time to these reports of these road issues and potholes and and you know, uh, along with the equipment, our city council has also um, has also uh, awarded some on call contracts with paving companies who we can call you know at a moment's notice to come out and help with the potholes right so that you know a lot yeah. of a lot of good things there so i started here um in march of last year and um it was a very rainy season uh that that winter in fact um my first day here at city hall uh we had a big snowstorm oh. and it, boy it was beautiful by the way for anyone who hasn't been to city hall please please come by and take a look say hi but the views out the back of this building um, are phenomenal of kind of the, the valley and the, the mountains and everything was covered with snow. It was beautiful, but yeah. it was a very wet year. And when there's a lot of rain, uh, potholes uh, pop up um, a lot. Uh, rain and is, is rough on, on streets. And um, we were getting a lot of complaints um, about mm -hmm. potholes and how long it was taking to get them filled. And when I got here, um, the public works department only had three staff assigned to the to streets. Um, we've improved on that a little bit. We have five now, right? Right. Um, but it's still when, you know, when, when there's a lot of rain, when there's a lot of issues, it's, you know, we just don't have the staff to, to respond really quickly enough. And so, um, as you mentioned, you know, we implemented this, this new practice of utilizing on-call paving contractors. So, um, you know, uh, potholes are popping up, other road repairs are needed. Our staff uh, are, are too stretched. We have a list of these contractors that, that we call. They come out right away. They fix the problem. And with the app, it's beautiful because you can report a, pro uh, a problem. It'll geotag where that problem is, get, get sent uh, to Public Works. Yeah. And sometimes as quickly as the same day, yeah. someone comes out and is working on the pothole, and we've received tremendous response on that. Yeah, yeah. with that app, you can also take a photo we, you know, so we can see exactly where it is. And, and uh, uh, yeah, usually, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's useful for staff internally too because we use we can use it for tracking purposes too right so, right yeah. so we have this pavement management program and we you mentioned we do this kind of survey um every five years and it, it tests the the condition of all of our streets but but how do we from there how do you prioritize uh which streets get worked on because um we get we get calls all the time and messages all the time from people that say my street's in terrible condition. I can't remember the last time it was repaved. I've lived here for you know X number of years. I've never seen it repaved. Um, uh, and, and you know, I, I wish we could just respond to all of those requests immediately and repave the streets. Yeah. But I think we did just just for um, for fun uh, a month or two ago. We, we we did an exercise where we figured out how much it would cost to repave all of the streets in Ukaipa all at once. Um, and I believe the figure was 140 million dollars. Right. $140 million to repave the 209 yeah. miles of the street. Yeah. yeah. So clearly um, that's um, uh, not within our budget. Um, so we have to prioritize. How do we do that? Well, well, as I mentioned, every five years we do test the streets. That we don't do it. We hire a company that does this nationwide. They have specialized equipment. They drive every, you know, all 209 miles of street and they test it. They test the streets. On, for, they test several different factors of the street. And and they take all that information and they rank the condition of the street on a number from zero to 100, the pavement condition index or PCI. And based on that, uh, you know, obviously 100 is a brand new paved street, zero is a street that probably doesn't even exist. So we take that information along with uh, the traffic, the average daily uh, traffic volume on that street, the classification of the street, whether it's a residential collector or an arterial street, and also the land use is adjacent to the street. So all four of those factor, factors play a role into how we prioritize those streets. So, um, you know, you might have a, a short cul-de-sac where you have four or five homes on that, on that cul-de-sac that only, you know, only the people that live on that cul-de-sac, maybe there's a total of 12 or 15 trips per day. That compared to a, 
uh, another road where where it's a collector street that serves several neighborhoods you're going to have you know higher traffic so you know all of those things play a factor we we prior we prioritize the list and we we present it to the city council as part of our draft pavement management program for the next year and um you know with input from the public and city council and there there's some adjustments that are made but essentially what that final list is that's how we that's what we use so, for, so when you say uh, adjustments can be made based on input from the public mm -hmm. uh, wh what would an example be so for example if um someone were to take you golfing <laughs> would would their street be prioritized <laughs> absolutely not no okay all right just saying if ryan miller's street gets uh, paved i'm gonna know <laughs> why that happened uh, no, some of the, the, the input that we receive is related to um, somebody may, be, may have some planned utility work where if they're going to be trenching in the street or doing some other work, then, and, and then we put that street off a few years and we bring in another street in. But yeah, there's, uh, um, yeah, and you know, this year as part of putting together that plan, we had a couple community meetings where we involved the public. Um, you know, we had a public outreach and and there were some people that uh, that reached out to us and, and said, "Hey, you know, I've lived here for, uh, you know, since the early '70s, and no, this street has never been maintained." It's before the city was even a city. Yeah, before the city was even a city. So yeah. we, we went back and looked at it specifically, and and um, you know, found out that there were some, uh, um, you know, the, the equipment that we use to measure it can only detect certain things. But uh, obviously, what what what. Uh, deteriorates the asphalt is what's going on on the edges mo most of the time and if you have the vehicle that's eight feet wide that's driving the, the lane then maybe they're only measuring that but what's causing the issues is something outside of that so those are the kind of factors that we look at interesting so, interesting. so now that the pavement management program has been adopted uh, i think you know we're going to start to see some major road work uh, in a few stretches here pretty soon in september really so give us an idea of what uh, what people can expect to see here in the short term yeah, so the, our city council has already awarded two contracts. One is our rehabilitation, our pavement rehabilitation uh, program, which is a program which will completely repave streets. The other one is microsurface, where you take a street that's in pretty good condition and we just need to seal it, make it more, make the surface more level, uh, seal it to keep the water out because that's what what deteriorates asphalt. Uh, both of those contracts have been been awarded, so you'll be, um, uh, you know, we're. We're working through all the details with, details with the contractor right now. So in the month of September and October, we'll be seeing a lot of uh, uh, repaving of streets. Um, some of the major streets, that, major streets that will be repaved is uh, you know Fifth Street between Wildwood Canyon and Avenue H, um, a portion of Yucca Boulevard. Again, these are some of the arterial streets, but but along but also with that is a, a lot of our residential and collector streets throughout the city. Now Fifth Street, that's going to be a, a full closure of Fifth Street, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, about what yeah. time frame are we expecting that to happen? Uh, that is going to be uh, middle of September. Sometime. Okay. Yeah, okay. and it's a full closure because of the the nature of the roadway. It's just it's not a straight road, and it, it's best to just close it so you don't. Uh, sometimes you can pave half of the road at a time, but here because of the curves, it's just better to close it. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's amazing to me. You know, traffic engineering really is a science, uh, and I think a lot of times people um, believe that you know we can just. Um, um, run out and, and, and fix a road or throw up a stop sign. And, you know, very often stop signs are one we get, we get a lot stop signs and speed bumps, right? Like right. Uh, people are speeding down our street. Can you guys put up a speed bump or put a stop sign here? Um, and uh, we, we often get requests from members of the city council who have heard from their constituents and uh, you know, we've got a, we, we think this is a dangerous area on our street. You know, can you please install a stop sign? And, uh, you know, I, I wish it were that easy, but um, we really have to study those things. There are you know, these, yeah. these you know, people who go to school and study traffic engineering, and, and there's a science to it. Um, stop signs are a great, great example. Uh, if you install a stop yeah. sign somewhere where one really isn't warranted, um, very often drivers will start to just ignore that stop sign. I think we've probably all experienced stop signs like that where you stop and you you look around there's there's no one there the next time there's no one there's no one ever there and you think why why am i why am i stopping here this is silly so pretty soon cars just um decline to stop and they, they just blow right through it right the same but in the meantime a pedestrian comes along and they they see that stop sign they they have a false sense of security because there's a stop sign and maybe a crosswalk there and Pedestrian crosses, cars are ignoring the stop sign. It's a very dangerous situation. So those are the kinds of things that traffic engineers analyze 
right. and decide whether um, you know uh, whether the the requested uh, measure like a stop sign or a speed bump is is warranted and whether yeah. it's safe. Yeah, a lot of those traffic uh, uh, the traffic control devices actually you know we can't like as you mentioned we can't just install a stop sign or even a, a traffic signal or a speed hump or a crosswalk. We have to go, there's a process that the, that the state of California has in place to go through that. It's all about liability, right? Like, as you mentioned, if we install something that's not warranted and something happens, then the city could be liable because it wasn't warranted. We didn't go through the proper uh, warrants and studies to do that. So and we right. do get a lot of requests for stop signs and, and uh, speed humps, but uh, all of those crosswalks, speed humps, uh, um, traffic signals. They, they, they are. You know, we have to go through that process just to make sure that they that they're warranted. Well, and if we don't, then there's a it's a tremendous liability yeah. for the city. Yeah, yeah. So Ukaipa is really um, it's actually kind of a, a family affair uh, for you, isn't it? Um, uh, you, you have a, <laughs> your daughter uh, Mia uh, also works in local government here in Ukaipa for the Ukaipa Valley Water District. Yeah, she does. She's also uh, an engineer, and she's. I've uh, been working at Yucaipa Valley Water District for, oh, time flies, two years. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Well, it might be four years. I don't know. Three think years, it, maybe. I think three it might years. be. Yeah, three or four years, I think. She's been there, been there for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where did she uh, go to school for engineering? She went to San Diego State University. Okay. Yeah. Is their program better than Redlands? Oh, of course. Okay, good. So <laughs> who, 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 who's, who's the better engineer? Uh, I would have to say that she is. So if she were <laughs> the city engineer... Would County Line Road Project be done by now? Uh, it would have been done two years ago. Is she, is she looking for a job? <laughs> well, I, I hope by Joe Zoba's not listen, watching or listening to this. Uh, well, you know, there are a lot of things yeah. about you for me that, that a lot of people don't know. Um, one of them is that you are a huge Swifty. Oh, my gosh. Do we have a picture of that? Look at this. <laughs> Look at that. That's you in a Taylor Swift T-shirt. Oh. Uh, you, you, you actually, you went to a Taylor Swift concert not that long ago. I heard. Uh, okay, next. <laughs> you don't want to talk about this a little bit, a little bit, a little bit longer. Uh. Um, yeah. So I mean, uh. you and your family have been in Ukaipa for for a, for a long time. Mm -hmm. I live in yeah. Chapman Heights. I think you probably. Um, uh, played there as a child, and, and what, yeah. you know, used to be was it Orange Groves there? And yeah, growing up, um, I lived on Oakland Road, and yeah, I remember uh, jumping on my bike, and yeah. Where where was the house that you grew up? Uh, it was right across the street from the community park. Okay, Chap Chapman Heights homes are built there, but yeah, right across the street from Chapman okay. from from the regional park and the community park. Okay, yeah, okay. I grew up there, and yeah, that was back. Uh, actually, that was, uh, I remember uh, people that lived here in Yucapa uh, a long time remember the dips in the road, the low water crossings. Well, yeah. there were two on Oakland Road where, you know, if you could talk your parents into going fast enough, it was a pretty fun ride through those dips <laughs> in the road. And I grew up, I lived between the two dips on the road in Oakland Road. So I remember when it was raining, it was difficult to get to school because you couldn't you know, you couldn't cross the street and, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's pretty neat to be part of the, the city now and be and uh, being part of the engineering group that built the bridges over those dips. So, you know, I guess that uh, the reason why those dips are no longer there, that is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you've seen a, a lot of change yeah. uh, in the time you've been here. Uh, you know, as you think about where the city has been and the direction we seem to be going, mm -hmm. Um, what, what's exciting to you and also what concerns you? Not, not as an employee, but as, mm -hmm. as someone who um, has been here pretty much their entire life and has seen things change. Uh, what's exciting? What concerns me? Well, um, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, I have a lot of friends. I grew up here we were in with a lot of family and friends, some of them who still live here, and, and they often make comments about, you know, uh, we need to keep you kind of rural keep you kind of, mm -hmm. uh, that rural feeling. And to a certain extent, you know, I, I, I have the same sentiment, mm -hmm. but now being involved, being involved in local government and knowing how it works and how, uh, you know, the revenue that's generated, you know, where it comes from and, and what that goes to, um, uh, uh, the, I know that, that we need a certain amount of development to, 
to to be able to sustain the city of Yukaipa. Right. And um, you know, one of my my concerns is that uh, you know there's a, is and I have this conversation with people uh, outside of work all the time. You know, well, you've lived here for a long time. You you need to you know help fight and keep Yukaipa rural and you know no development and this and that. And I try to explain to them, you know, that and in a perfect world, yes. But in reality, if we want to make Yukaipa sustainable, we have to have uh, responsible growth. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be part of a lot of that growth um, uh, throughout, you know, over the years. And and so the the concern that I have is is, uh, it, and I want to help, I want to help people understand that you can still maintain that rural feel but still have the responsible growth that we need to build that tax revenue to be able to provide the services that people are used to. I agree. And I, I think that really is our, our task here, right? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I moved here in 2015 after looking around at all the other cities in the region and decided on Yukaipa for a number of reasons. But the more rural nature was one of the big reasons, that and the people that live here and just being such a patriotic community and a community that embraces public safety and um, you know, just, just all the, the things that make you, you Kaipa a unique community, but our, our rural, more rural feel was definitely something that, yeah. that, that attracted me. Um, and I, you know, I, I want to hold on, hold on to that as well. Um, but I, I think, you know, when people tell me, you know, we need to ma- remain a small town, I mean, that ship has sailed, right? I yeah. mean, we're, we're, we're a mid-sized city of 55,000 people mm-hmm. now. Now we can hold on to a small town feel, right? Right. right. Uh, and when you when I when I go up drive or walk through uptown, I mean it feels like small town USA, right? And uh, I don't think we're ever going to lose the 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 ruralness of the feel of the town. I mean we, we'll always have the mountains, right? We'll always have these spectacular views in the winter, covered with snow. And, you know, it's gorgeous. Um, but given that we've grown to fifty five thousand people who all need services. Um, you know, our, our revenue, our revenue sources have not kept up. Right. Uh, we've built a lot of rooftops. The commercial has lagged behind. Now we have some restaurants and some shops and the Ukaipa Point project on Ukaipa Boulevard down by the freeway is definitely helping. But if you think about it, we don't have the big regional shopping centers, the big box stores, the, the auto malls that, that most cities rely on to bring in a lot of sales tax revenue. Right. right? And so as we've grown, and, and our cost of providing services to those areas have grown, you know, road maintenance, police, fire, et cetera. And as the cost of public safety has grown exponentially over recent years, um, you know, we, we just, our, our revenues haven't kept up and that's why we're, we're facing such a, a, big, a big deficit that we have to work our way out of now. But I, I think, you know, this community is gonna have to face a, a, a reality that you can't have it all ways, right? You can't say, I don't want any development, and at the same time, don't tax me, but I want all the services. Right? Something, yeah. some, something's got to give, right? Yeah. And I, I think long-term economic development has to be the solution, right? But as you mentioned, done in a way that, that we're not losing the unique look and feel that is the city of Ukaipa. Right, right. And to answer right. the second part of your question, you know, one of the things that excites me is that you know, we have – we have some, uh, we have several opportunities in front of us that can lead us towards that long-term economic development, and um, uh, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, one of the things that excites me is to try to, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, in my role, is, and also with our our deputy director of community development, our city planner Ben Matlock, our role is to collect all the information, collect all the facts. And based on what other cities have done and what's worked in other cities and what hasn't, you know, present that information to the planning commission and the city council and say, hey, based on every, everything that we've done, all the facts, this is we, what we feel is the best for the community moving forward from a, from a land use and zoning uh, perspective. And, and not only that, you know, t- t- all of those, it, it's, not only our, it's not only our recommendation, but it's also this has gone through the process this has been vetted and it's it, it's it, it's not like you can just um uh drive by an empty field or an, or, or a vacant piece of property not knowing who owns it or anything and say well i want the city to build 
this there. Right. Well, it's not that easy because, first of all, the city doesn't own the property. It's up to the property owner whether they want to do something or not. And then there's a process they have to go through. Yeah. So I, that's another thing we get a lot in local yeah. government, not just here, but everywhere is why don't they build the following use on, right. on, on, on that property? But there is a thing uh, uh, called private property rights uh, in right. this country and, and uh, um, yeah. e- even in uh, California believe it or not. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, the city doesn't have a right to dictate what goes where. We do have zoning in place. Yeah. We have uh, allowable land uses. But but within those parameters that are established yeah. in our in our general plan and our zoning, um, uh, you know, if, if a property owner wants to bring a, a project that's consistent, uh, we, we really can't say no. We, we, can, yeah. we can make sure that certain impacts are mitigated. We can look at you yeah. know, architectural guidelines. Um, but... Um, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, why, why don't why don't you bring in a you know, a Whole Foods or something, right? Yeah. Well, um, that's not a decision the city gets to make. Yeah, I'll, right? I'll give you an example. Today at lunch, I went and I bought a sandwich at a local place here. I was walking back to my truck, and somebody that I know, uh, you know, said, "Hey, for me, how's it going?" So I was talking to them, and they said, "Hey, can I ask you a question?" Sure. Why did the city decide to? Uh, to develop a raising canes in front of the high school, <laughs> yeah. and uh, that, my answer was, well, first of all, the city doesn't own the property. The per, the property owner that owns the property has a right to do whatever they want as long as it meets the development code and, and the criteria of the city, and they process it through. Mm-hmm. We made sure that we tried to to uh, mitigate the impacts that it could cause, and we helped them through the design process to mitigate. You know the fact that there's a high school cross street and everything, and uh, met all the criteria. And you know we, you know, so the you know, the property owners doing what they can do, but it wasn't it wasn't the city bringing it. It was right. the city processing it at the request of the property owner. We just have to make sure that it's done in a responsible way. Right. Yeah. Right. So you know yeah. we, we do have some um, uh, input and control over, or the city council does anyway, on, on setting what that general plan is and what the zoning right. is and the allowable uses, and um, you know uh, general plans are typically updated, you know, every so many years. Um, we're probably coming up on, on, a, on a point where it's time for us to start uh, yeah. looking looking at that again. Um, um, but you know, as a community, we have to really give a lot of thought to you know what we want our community to look like, um, and not just in terms of you know physically you know uh, land use but in terms of service levels right and we have grown accustomed to a very high level of service here in ukaipa in terms of our, our police service our, our fire service uh, community services you know the, mm-hmm. the, the parks and and the, the programming for youth and seniors here uh, the festivals that this the city puts on are unlike anything i've seen in in, in any other city both in terms of um, the quality and the number that that are put on every year but yeah. all those things uh, help to build a, a sense of community, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but they're all very expensive, and yeah. um, you know, we're as we've grown and and everything's gotten more expensive, uh, we're very quickly coming to a point where we have to make a decision as a community. You know, we're 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 going to have to we're going to have to pay the freight if we want the services to remain at the levels they are today, and if not, that's okay too. But then people have mm-hmm. to understand that, um, you know we're not going to have all those services, at least at the levels that they are now. Right. Right. And so that's something we're going to have to really come to, to come to grips with. We've got, um, there is a, um, a, a 1% sales tax measure on the ballot uh, this November. Um, and I think our job there as a city is not to advocate one way or the other, but to, uh, present the information. So people really clearly understand the choice that's in front of them. Right. Right. Um, do we want to be able to maintain our roads? Uh, do we want to be able to have, um, you know, quick response times for police and service, uh, police and fire. Um, you know, do we want to have um, parks and senior programming and you know youth programming um, at the levels that we do now? Um, yeah. And um, I have an opinion on that uh, as a resident here of Ukaipa. Um, but um, at the end of the day, it's going to be a, a community-wide decision. Right? Yeah. I think one of the neat things about Ukaipa is that an unusually high percentage of the employees that work here at City Hall live here in Ukaipa. Um, higher percentage, I think, than I've seen anywhere else. I, we we probably ought to calculate that at some point. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd, I'd love to know exactly, but um, it seems like uh, more of our employees, you know, live here than than don't. You yeah. know, and to me, that's huge because you know it's not just a job for us. This is um, this is where we live. This is our lives. Our families are here. We're we're invested in everything that's done here. You know, I'm, I'm sure yeah. it's 
must be hugely gratifying for you when you're working on a public works project and the project is complete and then you and your family are are using um, yeah. that infrastructure, right? Yeah, that's uh, happened a couple of times over the years, you know, whether it's a, the, a park or, a, a, you know, driving over a bridge somewhere, but yeah. Yeah, it certainly has been a, uh, a, over the last 20 years that I've worked here, being a part of, being a part of the community and also working in the community that you live in, so. Yeah, it's pretty special. Yeah, it's it, special. Uh, it makes it uh, much more meaningful. Yeah. 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 Well, you are a huge part of this community and certainly of the city organization um, in terms of the number of years you've been here and all the different hats and all the services you provide here. And I really appreciate all the work that, that you do, um, you know, for the city and, and for all of us, for all of us who live here. Thank you. Uh, Happy to do it. Yeah, and thank so. you for being here on episode number two of sure. UKIPA 360. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Mm. Uh, for me and Preciado, Director of Development Services, City Engineer, Public Works Director, and uh, almost lifelong UKIPA resident.